When it comes to successful video game sequels throughout history, few are more important than that of Street Fighter 2, a title that introduced more new fans to the franchise than those who had played the first 1987 game. What many people tend to overlook today though is that arguably Street Fighter 2 is not the only sequel to the Maiden entry in the series, with there being several other titles in existence that attempted to exist as such. Before we got Street Fighter 2, Capcom would give us an NES Street Fighter game that was drastically different to its predecessor, one of which where a cyberpunk dystopia was explored. Did Japan get their wires crossed with the development of this action platformer? How did a martial artist that entered a tournament in 1987 end up as a cyborg scientist trying to stop a parasitic outbreak two decades later? Hindsight is 2020, or maybe in this case, 2010, as this side story today stands out as one of the weirdest adventures in the Capcom gaming multiverse. Well, maybe not as weird as when E Honda got heavily invested in horse racing, but that's a story for another day. Putting jokes to one side, without further ado, let's break down what is by far the strangest video game to carry the Street Fighter branding. So hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Pat here. This is the story of Street Fighter 2010, The Final Fight. This one is simply ludicrous. Yeah. The year is 1990 and it is just months before Street Fighter 2 would hit arcades and effectively redefine one-on-one -on -one brawlers for decades to come. During this strange era, Capcom seemed to be exploring a range of options with regards to where to send the series next. In the original game, players were limited in their selection. Player 1 would always be Ryu, the at this point red-headed martial arts warrior destined to take down Sagat at the end, and Player 2 meanwhile was relegated to his red gi wearing friend, of course known as Ken. But on the NES, rather than getting another one-on-one -on -one fighter, we would instead get something out of left field completely. To be able to fully understand Street Fighter 2010, the final fight, you have to time travel back 30 years ago to where Capcom were in the late 1980s. Street Fighter was a success to be sure, but with director Takashi Nishiyama having left for SNK to eventually develop the Fatal Fury franchise, the future was wide open to continue the brand. The possibilities were endless. Progressing past the 1987 original, Capcom would infamously begin working on an arcade beat-em-up which at least for a while would carry the Street Fighter name. This game would of course eventually be named Final Fight after arcade vendors at trade shows raised concerns that the title was nothing like the Street Fighter game that they had had in arcades previously. Test marketed as Street Fighter 89 and eventually being revealed to take place in the same universe as the other Street Fighter games, Final Fight was a different beast completely. While Street Fighter was a rudimentary one-on-one -on -one fighter with limited movesets and in the original release a wild pressure sensitive button system, Final Fight would open up weapons, health pickups and full 360 degree movement. If a game had continued to be known as Street Fighter 89, it would have been seen as a proper evolution of the previous fighter. Breaking away from one-on-one -on -one matches, your hero character was no longer a nondescript martial artist against a litany of more interesting villains, but one of three people who actually took on the titular concept they thought on the street. What a crazy concept, right? While the potential Street Fighter 89 could be seen as an improvement in every way, it wasn't truly the same game as before. Back to the drawing board, Capcom continued to develop a true arcade sequel with a targeted release date of early 1991. But since this was also the time period whereby the NES was in full swing, Capcom was able to explore what the franchise could be on the home consoles too. With a home console version of the original Street Fighter only ever truly finding itself on NEC's more powerful console at the time, despite a litany of later ports, official and unofficial, platformers were all the rage, since a certain mustachioed plumber followed Pac-Man's footsteps and redefined the side-scroller. So, if a Street Fighter game was to find mass market success on such a console, surely it needed to be a side-scrolling platformer, right? After all, all of the coolest games were, so plans were officially underway to make the NES's Street Fighter game more, well, nes -y. The results of this brand experiment were known as 2010 Street Fighter in Japan, 
a new action platformer that has more in touch with Bionic Commando and Strider than the Street Fighter or Final Fight titles. The cutting room floor highlights that the American release was developed before the Japanese one, which potentially means that either Capcom truly intended this to be an adventure for the World Warrior, or both countries had a base game and decided to put a different pair of heroes and villains into their story. While the US release came slightly later, the trademark icon on the Japanese release is placed where the Final Fight subtitle would be, if they hadn't removed it. In regards to this black sheep of the Street Fighter franchise, the Japanese version of the game features a star character who is an armoured warrior with blonde hair, who wears the Terminator's glasses. He is known as Kevin Stryker and is a galactic cybernetic police officer codenamed MX-5. Thanks to transliteration, he's also been known to have the last name of Straker, but modern Capcom rolls with Stryker. At a quick glance, you'd be forgiven for thinking he was a prototype design for Captain Commando, as there are certainly a lot of similarities between the two characters. Bearing the time frame in mind though, and looking at Japan in the late 1980s, this looks more like a reference to the Metal Hero series. That had its strongest decade leading up to that point. The Metal Heroes are another franchise in the world of Japanese tokusatsu heroes, but English speaking nations would only know them from their adaptation that led to VR Troopers in the 90s. Nowadays, they get Blu-ray releases and are folded into Power Rangers continuity, but in the 1980s, Japan had a whole line of galaxy police officers that looked like a family-friendly Robocop. Making action games after this franchise and heavily reworking them for America would continue with 1991 Super Rescue Soul Brain, receiving the game on the Famicom. When the Nintendo Entertainment System received the title, all marks of a Japanese superhero were removed, and the title was reworked into Shatterhand. In the original title, Kevin Stryker was out to defeat the parasites, people infected by armoured insects, that made them become haywired criminals. With energy bullets and sonic blades, Kevin could take the fight to them, and with flip jumps and shield capsules, he could protect himself. As a cyborg, he had enhanced skills and strength, but shouldn't feel pain. Despite this, he feels unnerved, and the plot reveals that he himself is one of the parasites he's sworn to fight against. Over his planet-hopping adventure, which has him leaving Earth with a special teleportation skill to jump to Tatooine and Dagobah, planets that might make a certain House of Mouse get litigious nowadays, he traces down the sources of the parasites Dr. Jose. When facing him, Kevin learns that he himself is one of the parasites. Jose then merges with the bio-boosted armour and becomes the final boss in Kevin's solo adventure. But this is of course just the story for the Japanese version of the game, with the American version of the title being far more hilarious. What is so special about this one is that the American side of Capcom opted to make this video game story a direct continuation of Street Fighter 1987 just set 23 years in the future, in the futuristic year of 2010. Finding the story awkward or otherwise unmarketable in America, as remember, it took until 1993 for characters like the Power Rangers to become the legends they're now known as internationally. Capcom decided to mix up the title a bit, revamping the story to turn Kevin into the recently cast Ken, and Dr. Jose into Troy, a never before heard best friend of Mr. Masters. Ooh, I guess both Ryu and Eliza are going to be hurt by that one. Adding the final fight to the title is actually a relatively reserved way to revamp the branding, but it's also a bit confusing. This title has nothing outright to do with the Final Fight arcade game. It makes more sense to call it the Bionic Commando, except they had already had a series based on that. Amusingly, to add to these hilarious localization choices, Capcom's modern marketing for the title for when it was re-released on the Nintendo 3DS and Wii U's eShop give the new plot the following description. It has been 25 years since Ken left the glory days of his fighting career. Since then, he has been working with his friend Troy to create Cyboplasm, an innovative formula that can turn ordinary humans into super beings of incredible strength. But one day, Ken arrives at their lab to find the formula stolen in a pile of jelly where he should have found Troy. Navigate across the galaxy as Ken follows the trail of his friend's murderer. Jump, climb, and fight your way past monstrous enemies as you complete the objective for each stage. Just like in his days in the Street Fighter world, 
Ken can punch and kick his way through danger, but he can also fire power shots from a distance. Will Ken be able to find justice at the end of his journey? Parasites have become the more game-centric Cyboplasm, which is a nice and clean way to explain why Ken can now shoot energy bullets and sonic blades. Given that he used to shoot fireballs and perform a flaming uppercut, I don't think we need to explain superpowers, but here we are. As players begin each stage in this one, they take charge of Ken as they get ready to do battle against a legendary opponent. Unfortunately, we do not get the likes of Ken vs Ryu or Ken vs M Bison, but this time every stage is Ken vs Target. Target. Yes, that's right, in the majority of stages, Ken's objective is to destroy a designated enemy, with each of them simply being labelled as his targets. Target? Destroying said enemy gives Ken the energy needed to open portals to progress, however some levels require him to destroy more than one enemy to move on. Controlling Ken with the NES controller means that one button can be used for attacking, with the other being reserved for jumping. The same as with many NES side-scrollers. He also has the abilities to climb walls, pole-like structures and hang onto and climb along ledges. Different jumps can also be performed, such as a backwards flip jump, and Ken can shoot his energy projectiles with his fists, both horizontally and vertically upwards. He can even shoot curved power shots if a player holds down the directional pad and B button simultaneously. Further to all of this, Ken can shoot downwards while doing a flip jump. Collecting power-ups increases Ken's projectile range and strength, but he can lose these upgrades easily if he loses lives. Like many old school NES games, this is one of those titles that expects gamers to learn as they go along, and features infamously punishing difficulty. The game's many cheap moments will mean that you will need to play this one over and over again to have any hope of getting anywhere with it. But I guess that is to be expected really with most games from the NES era. As 2010 is over a dozen years past at this point, what's the legacy of this often ridiculed 8-bit title today? Well, Capcom has largely chosen to ignore it, only broaching re-releases for the 3DS and Wii U, two consoles that had strong support from the company as a quick and easy cash grab for re-releases. Kevin and Dr. Jose have never made a cameo, playable or otherwise, in any of the following titles in the Street Fighter franchise. Yudon, Capcom's preferred comic creator in this day and age, has had a bit of fun with the title, including the fact that it makes no sense in modern Street Fighter continuity. In the 10th issue of Street Fighter Unlimited, a cybernetic Ken looks to be chasing down the likes of Cyber Akuma and Metal Zangief, but the comic eventually takes a step back and reveals that it's an old video game that licensed Ken's likeness, but due to various delays it took forever to come out, making the 2010 a bit outdated. That's as good as any other reason to justify its existence. Street Fighter 2010, English canonically, is like a bad licensed game simply starring Ken when it comes to it. Capcom's own promotional wiki, the Shadaloo Combat Research Institute, or simply CRI, did gain entries with new art for Kevin and Jose. These entries give a bit of a real-world background of the characters, complete with new custom art, but they also throw shade at the difficulty of the game, something that Capcom themselves highlighted in the original print ads in America. An unreasonably difficult NES game? Of course that also means two legendary content creators focused on the era would cover it. Both the angry video game nerd and the retro game master, known in his home country of Japan as Chief Arena of Game Center CX, who would highlight the title with modern eyes and anger. Contemporaneously, Nintendo Power would preview the game with the following inaccurate notes. Fans of the arcade hit should look out for the NES sequel, Street Fighter 2010, The Final Fight. This SF martial arts game tells the story of Ken's revenge, but the real action isn't in the story, it's in the play. Right from the start, Ken is in deep trouble with robots and hungry piranha. Your ability to flip, spin, leap, and even fire downward is your advantage over the aliens. While known for its intense difficulty and weird usage of the Street Fighter brand in the modern era, at the time, magazines and Capcom themselves looked to the game as the evolution of the franchise, or at least a competent platformer. Once the cartridge hit store shelves, it looks like nobody wanted anything to do with it, as finding reviews and coverage at the time is rather scarce. 
there was definitely hype leading up to it, but once it came amidst a glut of NES titles, it seems to have fallen by the wayside. Luckily, Street Fighter 2 will be right around the corner, and proved to be a definitive change in the franchise's history, basically resulting in Street Fighter 2010 becoming the Street Fighter game that Capcom would rather that we didn't talk about. I still think it is absolutely hilarious that this oddity exists though. Speaking of bizarre games that claim to be the sequel to Street Fighter, I guess that this means that I should also consider covering Human Killing Machine in the future, as Tiertex, who developed the home computer conversion of Street Fighter, would create Human Killing Machine as its follow-up, and dubiously claim it was Street Fighter's sequel. Anyway, if you enjoyed looking at this strange NES Street Fighter game, why not check out my previous video on the illegal version of Street Fighter 2, released for the hardware. Anyway, like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below for regular doses of Street Fighter's crazy history. Yeah, cheerio.